Hi, I'm Sharon Colvin. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the Vermont Department of Libraries, and it's January. It's a new year, and I have tons of books to tell you about. Um, so let's get started. I'm going to start with um, picture books, and then I have a couple of interesting nonfiction, then I have a couple of middle grade, and a couple of YA. So you ready? Um, let's start with this one. This is a really different kind of book. Let's see if I can figure out. I moved my desk so I can't figure out where the um, camera is. Here you go. Green Lizards versus Red Rectangles. And this book, I think it might have been written, um, it's English Illustrator. And I think this book is fascinating. So it's basically a war between the Green Lizards and the Red Rectangles which is a strange concept, but the kids will understand it. Um, so they basically, they have a war, and, um, you know, they attack each other. <laughs> nice, right? And um, there seem to be a whole lot of lizards. Let me just show you how many lizards there are. Yeesh! It's a little creepy, actually. Look at that. Eek. Okay, so, anyway. They fight, and they fight, and they fight. And finally, one of the lizards says... Sorry, I'm trying to get used to this. Here we go. What are we fighting for? Which is a valid question, right? And so he's trying to decide what the heck's going on and what happens? He's squashed by a red rectangle. They're not having it. Um, and so they fight some more, and it's the biggest war ever. And they fight and they fight and they fight. Look at this war. It's crazy. And then at the end, they figure out how to live peacefully together. Because one of the red rectangles says, enough is enough. And they finally found a way to live in peace together. And this is how they decided to live. <laughs> um, so not much to the, the plot, but I like the story a lot. I think it's cute. Um, it's presented in a different way. Um, it's about peace. It's about um, conflict resolution. And it's totally appropriate for your little um, story times, your preschool story times. Um, so I think it's a good one. So I have to warn you, I'm a little higher up. I got a taller desk. So when I throw the books down on the ground, uh, gravity is going to make them a little loud. We're just going to try them. We're going to roll with this this time. All right, here's another really cute one for your story times. Spare Dog Parts by Allison Hughes. I think this book is adorable, especially if you have a pet or if your kids have pets. Um, and it's all about the perfect dog and what makes the perfect dog. And in this story, it says, when my dog was made, they used leftover parts. And they put her together like a big dog puzzle. And there she is. And the little girl in the book is kind of like a mad scientist. She imagines that she made her dog um, with all these little parts um, with mismatched legs and kind of like a, a nose that nobody else wanted and like a goofy looking tail and, um, and that he didn't get the best brains because everyone else got the, the good brains. So they got like the sale price brains. Um, but she said, you know, he understands enough, like where the sunbeam falls and the sound of food. And he also knows when she needs him. And it says, two melting soft brown eyes were thrown into the mix and the biggest dog heart that ever beat. It fills her tubby, stubby body with love and keeps her tail wagging endlessly, even when she sleeps. When dog was my dog was made, they used leftover parts, but somehow when they fit them together like a big dog puzzle, they made the perfect dog. And I just think that is adorable. I think that um, your kids in story time will really like the message. I think it's really cute. If you have a group, they'll start talking about their, their animals and the silly things um, that they love about their pets because we know that the most imperfect pets are the best. Here goes this back. See? All right, this book is different. Um, I'm not actually sure. It must be an artist, yeah, who wrote this book. It's called ABC Dream. And, um, you know, I was hanging out with an art teacher on the Red Clover Committee, and I have a new appreciation for illustrations. I mean, I've always liked illustrations, but um, the way that some books just kind of glow and jump right off the page, I really like this one. So this is an alphabet book, and there are no words. Um, of course, they're the letters. And 
each picture, each spread is complicated and it's not only the letter, um, but lots of things that start with that letter and they're all kind of put together. So here, of course, you have ants, you have apple, you have arrows, um, you have argyle. Um, and then let's look a little bit further. F, you have fish and foxes and ferns. It's a gorgeous book. And J, you have jar and jellyfish. And for K, you have kittens and keys. Um, and so it goes like that for every letter. And then at the end, um, there is a little cheat sheet <laughs> for we grown-ups who might not have noticed everything. Um, but look at all of those different um, those different words that fit into each of these these pages. And so I think this could be really fun for a group where you could explore the pages and, and try to get the kids to tell you what do they see. What starts with S? What do they see um, in this picture that starts with S? You see sun? Do you see spots? Do you see a shell or a snail or a strawberry or a spider? And I bet the kids could really help pick this stuff out. Um, so it's an ABC book, and usually ABC books, in my opinion, are kind of boring. But this one I think is pretty interactive, and I think it could be really good for group sharing. Um, and if you need an ABC book, all the better, right? Very, very pretty. All right, this one's a little sillier. Henry wants more. I feel like there are a lot of books on this topic, um, but for whatever reason, kids love them. So who are we to, um, to say? Um, it's basically a story about this kid who always wants more. Now, one of the things I really love about um, this picture book is that um, the family's interracial and intergenerational. So if you look at that, there's a grandmother, there's a mom, there's, I think, a dad, sisters, um, and they're all together in one house, and this little boy is just, you know, rambunctious and always wants more, and um, kind of wears the family out, and I love this picture. Okay, he says more, and the family says, ugh. <laughs> Even the dog looks exhausted. Um, and so finally he falls asleep. So, you know, um, there you go with the sleeping house. They all fall asleep and he snores. Um, and at the very end, he peeps. He needs another storybook. Um, so anyway, this, this book is not groundbreaking. However, I do think that um, the way that this has been modernized is by making the family a little bit more diverse. Um, so if you um, need a replacement for one of those other books, um, or if you just need more picture books that have more diversity in them, this could be a good one to add to the collection. Um, if not, you could probably skip it. Okay, this one is just sweet and goofy, and I think it can be really cute for an excitable group for story time for the wee ones. Um, it also could be a good um, one for spring. It has like a vague Easter kind of thing to it because it's a bunny and, a, and an egg. So it's a friend. It's a friend for Bo, and it's basically about this lonely bunny who's looking for a friend, and he finds an egg, and he and the egg. He thinks his eggs is this friend, which the kids are going to find hysterical. And um, he draws a face on the egg, and they go and they have adventures. Oh, he calls the egg Raleigh, which I think is hysterical. Um, and they go out and they have fun. Um, and, of course, Raleigh doesn't say anything and doesn't do anything, and so he has to do all the work. And then <laughs> Raleigh rolls over the cookies, and look at that bunny's face. I'm so backwards here. Okay, here we go. Do you see his face? Oh my gosh, he's so upset. And he's so upset that his cookies got smashed. And <laughs> he says, we're just going to go. We, I think we should go. And Raleigh just kind of sits there and smiles because he's an egg. I think the kids are going to think this is hilarious. And so he had to help him out of the boat. And he thumps home and he's all grumpy. And um, then, oh, this part I just cracks me up. So he goes home and um, Bo wants to get into bed, but Raleigh's in the middle of the bed, and he asks Raleigh to move over, but Raleigh doesn't move because he's an egg, and so he ends up sleeping on the floor, which I think is hilarious because um, this happens with real pets or friends, um, so I thought that was hilarious, but then, of course, the egg cracks, and I was worried at first that the egg was going to 
be destroyed. But no, a duckling came out. And then he has a real friend um, to play with, which is exciting. And, you know, he's really excited, and he plays with the, um, the duckling, and they have adventures together. But the funniest part, are you ready, is... It's like Humpty Dumpty. He taped the egg back together. So it's not just uh, Bo and the duckling. It's Bo and the duckling and Raleigh taped back together. He's like a, I don't know, zombie egg. Um, so I think that there's a lot to this story. And I think it's cute and good for spring. Um, good for your, your wee ones who like this kind of ironic humor. Um, you know, it tickled me. What can I say? All right, that's all I have for picture books. Um... I have to say, this time of year is kind of slow for publishing, which is fine with me, because I'm up to my eyeballs in a, in a book review, um, book award reading. Um, if you're interested in what I'm reading or what the committees are, are thinking about, definitely check out my other video series, um, which is What is Sharon Reading? If you go to our YouTube channel, um, and you can see all of my videos um, and be happy to share with you what I'm reading and what I like. Um, I have some strong opinions and some of them people don't agree with, which is totally fun. <laughs> All right. So I've got nonfiction for you. Um, this is a picture book nonfiction, um, and it's on Hillary Clinton. Obviously it got really good reviews. Um, I think the picture on the front is a little odd, but you know, um, this is written from kind of a feminist point of view. Um, it starts out, you know, once there was Queen Elizabeth, then there was Joan of Arc, then there was Rosie the Riveter, and now there's Hillary, which is a little melodramatic, but, you know, it's okay. Um, and it's all about her kind of rise to power and um, how she um, she's this unstoppable force. Um, the art is pretty good, and it's got a lot of facts in it. Um, so it could be a good addition to your biography collections um, if kids are, are curious um, about Hillary and um, especially as the election comes up, um, this could be, could be a decent addition for you. Um, like I said, I got decent reviews. All right, my next two nonfiction are a little bit older, um, probably middle school. Um, this one is a little um, older. It's a paperback. I get, every once in a while, the publishers send me paperbacks, which is fine because it's cheaper for them. Um, but that means I'm behind a couple of years. This is called Han Hannah's Suitcase. Um, and it, I think this might have some appeal for your kids. Um, it's a couple of years old, like I said. Um, it was an ALI Notable Children's book. Um, it had got all sorts of awards. And um, it's got an interesting kind of layout. Um, it's got lots of pictures. Um, lots of information. It's nonfiction, um, and it's about this suitcase that showed up in a Holocaust education center in Tokyo in 2000, and it had the names Hannah, um, Hannah Brady on it, and it said she was an orphan, and that's all it said, so they had to open up the suitcase and start doing some digging, and so this story is um, part of that investigation and then trying to figure out who this girl is and why this suitcase showed up from Auschwitz. Uh, and then the other part is kind of her story and what it was like going from um, camp to camp. And um, from the reviews, I haven't read it yet, but from the reviews, it's not super depressing like some of the other books. Um, and it could be interesting um, for your kids who like a, a little mystery um, with their history. It rhymes, I know, um, and um, need like some, it's some narrative nonfiction um, to go along with uh, um, an interest in, in World War II. So this could be, could be an interesting collection, uh, interesting edition. Plus it's in paperback, so it could be a little cheaper. All right. Now, this book, I have to confess, I love this kind of true crime. Uh, Lizzie Borden has been somebody I've been kind of obsessed with since I was a kid, so I I, of course, picked this book up. Um, I just think she's fascinating. And one of my friends has a tattoo of her on her arm, if you're watching this. Um, anyway, so I find it fascinating. Here's the weird thing. The reviews for this book are saying middle school. The cover doesn't look middle school to me, and the length doesn't look middle school to me. Um, however... I think it's worth a try. The reviews, um, have, they say that it's very readable. There's tons of pictures in here and factoids. And what they're telling, they're saying in the reviews is that it reads, um, like one of those true crime miniseries or, or serial television shows that are on right now and that kids are really obsessed with. Um, and so it, it it's, 
people are saying it, it reads like fiction, um, like a murder mystery. So if that's the case, then maybe, maybe that it really is, um, it is good for middle school. It is long. Um, well, with all the notes and stuff, maybe it's 250. Um, there's a lot of notes and there's a whole end about researching the Bordens. Um, there's, like I said, a ton of pictures, quotes. Um, there's a whole map of the Borden family house. Um, and, you know, we all know the story, but the kids might not. Um, so if you have kids in your, um, in your libraries that like this kind of story and want to meet you and introduce them to it, this could be good. Um, my guess is that it's probably perfectly fine for high school as well. Um, because, you know, who doesn't like a good murder mystery? All right. Nonfiction is done. Okay, so I have a few um, chapter books for you here. We'll start with the youngest one. This is part of a series, and I don't usually review series, but this one looked really cute. Um, it's called Heroes of the Wild, is the series, and this is written by Nicola Davies. Um, it's short. I think it's written for, like, two to second to third grade, um, and it's about a little girl named Manuela, um, and she wants to hunt a manatee. She must live in Florida, I think, and she wants to, she wants to hunt a, man, a manatee, and she's with her father, and they harpoon a manatee and injure the calf in, um, in the process, and she thinks it's going to be the most exciting thing ever, but in reality, she feels horrible about it. And so she goes on this quest to save um, the manatee calf um, and to rescue it. Um, and it's written by a zoologist who really knows about this stuff. And it sounds like it's part kind of adventure story and part um, informational text. I got really good reviews, and I think... This could be a good addition to your collection um, if you have young kids who really like animals, who are interested in zoology, um, or who like a good mystery. You know, who doesn't like a good mystery? All right, here we go. This book looks hysterical. Now, by now you probably know that I have a soft spot for cats. I love cats. Um, this is a story, let me see if you remember his name, uh, Mr. Tibble. He is a writer for a newspaper, and he's about to get fired because he only writes about cats. He doesn't write about anything else, and his boss says, you have to write about um, the news or you're going to get fired. And then one day, um, this person named Miss Minou um, gets stuck up in a tree, and he thinks, ooh, a story. I'll go cover this story. And she's stuck up in a tree like a cat. And he notices that she kind of acts like a cat. She's afraid of dogs. She's always getting stuck in high places. And she starts to give him tips on some of the hot news stories in the town, including things that only a cat would know. Hmm. Um, you come to find out that she is a cat and that she ate something funny and has now been turned into a human and now she has to decide does she go back to her um her old life or does she stay human um so it's a short book you know uh definitely um probably like the fourth fifth grade level um let's see how long it is 150 pages um but it looks like a cute little mystery something fun to read um always looking for that fun stuff especially those ones that are a little young for um the Canfield Fisher Award. I need to see him get to get lost in the shuffle. Um, here's the Goblin's Puzzle. And let me show you the cover of this. It's fascinating. Um, this book has been compared to The Princess Bride, which, if you've read The Princess Bride, that is fighting words. Um, so, wow, it got some rave reviews. And let me read you a little dis um, description. So it's about the boy a nameless slave on a mission to uncover his true destiny. The goblin holds all the answers, but too tricky to be trusted. Plain Alice, who's a bookish peasant girl carried off by a confused dragon. And Princess Alice is the lucky girl who wasn't kidnapped. And so they have um, an adventure together and um, they have to crack the goblin's puzzle together. Um, and it looks like one of those fantastic adventure um, fantastical uh, stories the kids are going to love. So this one might be a good addition to your collection, especially if you like these um, adventure, fantasy adventure type books and good puzzle. It seems like there's a lot of good puzzle books these days. All right. So 
I should have looked this up before I started this video, but I didn't. Um, it must be the anniversary of the Japanese um, tsunami, maybe? It has to be. Um, it, because of these, I've got two books about the tsunami. Um, so this book here, Turn of the Tide, is about these two cousins. One lives in Japan and one lives in Oregon. And um, Kai lives in Japan and um, he is in Japan with his grandparents when the tsunami hits and he's unable to save them. And so he's carrying around a lot of guilt about that. And he's sent to Oregon to live with his cousins. And his cousin, um, Jet, um, she was on the ocean during the tsunami and wasn't supposed to be. And she ended up damaging the sailboat and feels terrible about that. So now Kai is afraid of the water and Jet has kind of a broken boat and is trying to earn her earn her back and they want to go on a sailing competition together. Um, so it's kind of a cousin story but also an interesting kind of um, a tragedy and both sides of it. And it's also interesting because they're a biracial family um, and they don't really know each other and they're getting to know each other. So it looks like an interesting adventure. Plus Kids don't often read about tsunamis. Um, Phyllis Reynolds Taylor has a new book out. It looks fantastic. Going Where It's Dark. Um, and this is about a kid named Buck. And he's having a crappy time. You know, his best friend just moved away. Um, and his uh, twin sister has a boyfriend. And so she's never around. And he's getting bullied because he stutters. Um, and the parents are trying really hard to figure out what to do with him because he's having all these problems. But really, all he wants to do is go cave exploring. Um, and he used to do that with his best friend, which was mildly safer. Um, but his best friend's not there anymore. So now he wants to go by himself. Um, and so this looks like one of those great, crazy adventure stories, survival stories, um, in, in the, uh, the grand tradition of Phyllis Reynolds Taylor. He got really good reviews. Um, the cover's not spectacular, but, um, I think this could be a good one for a kid. My pile is getting precarious. All right. Here is another one that's about, um, about the tsunami in Japan. Oh, yep. Yeah, so March 2011 is when the tsunami hit. Um, so it is, uh, it's coming up on five years. Um, and that is why all these books are coming up. This cover is phenomenal, in my opinion. I think it's really beautiful. So this is a little bit of an older book, maybe middle school. And it's about the tsunami. It's told in verse. Ta-da! Um, and... It's about a kid, also named Kai, um, who's a biracial teen um, in a coastal village, and she loses everything, or he loses everything. And then um, in the aftermath, he's given a chance to go to New York City um, after to see Ground Zero. And um, what had happened was that Kai's father was estranged from the family and was an Amer is an American, and so he uses that opportunity to go to Ground Zero to go find his father. Um, so this looks like a really interesting kind of complex coming of age story. Um, this idea of losing your entire family, not only your family, but your whole village, your town is gone, um, and kind of trying to find where you belong again. Um, so this is definitely a little bit more mature, but it looks interesting. Um, and again, you know, you can always tell those anniversaries when the authors start writing about all the same topics. All right, this is a, a little bit older even. It might be in middle school, early high school. Um, this book looks interesting. If you have kids who like um, kind of the mythology retellings, um, this is a story about Cupid and one of Cupid's minions. Um, and it's Aaron. He's the son of Cupid, excuse me. And he was supposed to, so there's a couple named Karma and Danny. And Aaron is supposed to shoot both of them with the love arrow and misses Danny completely and hits karma. So karma's in love with Danny and Danny is clueless. And, um, so, you know, things are just going awry. Um, and it's all Aaron's fault. And, but nobody knows that. So in the meantime, in kind of the aftermath of all of this, um, she gets pregnant. Um, she loses her ballet scholarship. Her life kind of gets turned upside down. And so, 
um, Aaron, Cupid's son, has to kind of fix it and has to go in and talk to Danny and try to figure out how to make him man up and um, be um, be good for um, for karma um, in this terrible situation. So. What I like about stories like this is that um, not only is it kind of a twisted take on um, mythology and fairy tales, but also it's a way of talking about real life problems like teen pregnancy and abusive relationships um, in a different way and, um, and kind of presenting it in a way that's easier to talk about. So I think this book, it got pretty good reviews. I think it could be, could be interesting, worth taking a look at. All right, two more and then we're done. Um, this book looks intense. What's broken between us? Um, this is definitely more of a high school book, um, and it's it's tragic. So it's about a girl named Amanda, and let me see if I can get it straight. Um, her brother Jonathan was driving drunk and killed somebody, and his, he, was, he was driving and killed somebody, and his girlfriend was in the car, and she's now paralyzed. He's been in jail for a year and has been out of touch, hasn't hasn't been talking to the family at all. And um, the thing is, is Amanda still really loves him and wants to forgive him. And so when he comes home, she's got to deal with this. Um, so she's in the middle of dealing with all of this when, of course, in school, she gets partnered up with this guy who happens to be the brother of his um, from her brother's ex-girlfriend, the one who's paralyzed. And so he hates her brother and doesn't want to have anything to do with the family. And so now she has to deal with all of these emotions. Um, so I think this is really a brother and sister story. Um, it looks tragic, obviously. And this idea of kind of what happens when someone you really love does something terrible. All right, last one. And I'm sorry to say it's not um, uplifting either. Um, this one got rave reviews all over the place. It's called Untwine, which is fascinating. And it's about twins and their names are Giselle and Isabel and they're inseparable from birth. Um, and then they're in a car accident and only Giselle wakes up. Um, and she, is in a coma at first where she can't move, but she can hear what's going on around her. Um, and she finds out that way that her sister has died. And so this is a lot like um, Gail Foreman's books where she's kind of in that in-between place where she knows she's alive, but she can't really do anything. And she has to decide, do I stay here in this kind of in-between place or do I go back to my life? Um, and she's really fighting it because having to go back and live without her sister um, does not sound very good. Um, so this one looks like a really interesting story. Intense. But I can see a story like this having some really good adult um, crossover. Um, I know I can't wait to read it. As soon as I have time. All right. That's all I have. And I'm losing my voice, so that's good. Um, uh, thank you for joining me. Here is my contact information. Um, here you go. If there are books that you think I should be reading or books that you'd recommend, um, just give me and send me an email. Give me a call. I'm happy to help anytime. Um, also, if you go to our website, which is libraries.vermont.gov, if you click on services and then click on children and teens, you'll find all sorts of information there, um, including information about these videos. You can also go to our YouTube channel, um, which is Vermont LIB, I think. And um, you can click on the author from this video and you'll see all of our videos. I've been doing this for over a year now. Um, so please take advantage of all those good resources. Uh, stay warm and I'll see you next month.